Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another week of the PM Show. I am one half of your dynamic hosting duo, Mandy Parsons. And on the line with me to help hold it down, if you will, tonight is Miss Danica the Great, who is forever filling in for John Moreland, I think, maybe for the rest of his life. Hello, Danica. <laughs> Oh, man, such honest behavior. I guess I better start whipping up into shape. <laughs> Hello, Mandy. Well, you know, I can say this. Not that your skills have, have ever been uh, lousy, but you certainly have uh, had a chance to practice and, and become the most amazing Danica the Great you can be on the air. Oh, well, thank you. I certainly do try hard and have you know tried to keep most of my nerdisms at the door, but sometimes I manage to slip out. We all have our nerdisms. So mm-hmm. it's not exactly like we can es- escape them. I just uh, I want tonight to be better than last week. Last week I don't think was bad. I don't ever go back and listen to what I've done weeks previous just because it's a superstition thing. And I know lots of um, movie actors and actresses who do that as well. They don't go back and watch themselves on film. No, they don't. There's a lot of them that refuse to watch their movies. Um, which always makes me wonder, when they go to those premieres, I mean, obviously they're going to try and promote the film and such, but do they actually go into the theater and watch it, or is it just some big party for people? I'm, I've always wondered that. You know, and you do bring up a good point. I have no idea myself, but I, I never go back and listen to what I do, and it's not because I think I'm bad at it. It's just I don't. I don't listen. I mean, I don't. I don't know how to explain it. I used to think that my sure. my voice was was not that good. I think if any of us listen to ourselves, we always say, eh, you know, we don't like our voices when you hear it on a recording. But lots of people are like, no, 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 you've got a great voice. Your voice is amazing. And I'm like, I don't know what you all are listening to, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, and sometimes you feel like when you approach certain subjects, you're thinking, oh, I. You know, I gave out that subject in the worst possible way. Why did I use this analogy? Or, oh, I totally forgot to mention this. And it just makes you want to kick yourself. And hopefully you learn it for the next time. And I I totally understand. Um, Sometimes, like when I first started getting into these kinds of shows, I would go back and listen and be like, oh, I sounded like I stuttered a lot there or I sounded much better. Um, or, you know, uh, I wish I would have brought up another point. But, you know, you are correct. For the most part, I don't really go back either unless someone asks, Oh, where were you at? And I'll be like, oh, here, let me show you the archives because you know, I, you know, I think they're decent, but you know, certainly there's always room for improvement. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, like I was saying, I don't ever go back and listen to the shows. I'm only assuming that last week was a train wreck. I can tell you uh, that with my job, I barely sleep these days, and I was um, not getting much sleep last week, and then I jumped on and started having tech difficulties. Things that we were able to do weeks previous, we just weren't able to do uh, last week. So at one point, my computer restarted, and I was on it, and you guys had to take the show for a little while. And then I was like, I can figure this out. I can do this. Because apparently, I'm the only one willing to buy Skype credits, so that we can all talk on Skype. But it's worth it. It's worth it to have you guys. Um, I wanted... Oh, go ahead. I said we had we said we had a mutiny for just a short brief time, and then we let you back on. Yes, and that is just fine. There, there are not any other people I'd I'd rather have take control and, and mutin mutiny on the show than you and Ken. <laughs> so, it's it's just fine with me. But I wanted to start out today by sharing a personal story with you. I can't, you know, I I'm into intuition and believing that people are intuitive. Yeah. Um, I have the most random example of that that happened to me today. Uh, I was in the classroom, and I was going over test prep materials with my students. Um, unfortunately, the students are taking three different tests this year, like big tests. And I, I hate to hear that, but it is what it is. We've got to do it. Mm-hmm. And there are these test books to practice reading comprehension. And there was one passage about how they were comparing cats and dogs. And they were talking about the history of cats and how the history of cats started out in Egypt or something like that, and they were feral, and they took them in, and they turned them into domesticated pets. And I'm just thinking, okay, well, there was one part that said, how did they get to other continents? Well, they, usually they followed people, or they were taken to other continents by 
said people who owned them. And I was just like, okay, well, one of the questions said, how did cats get to other continents? And there were four answers, and I wasn't satisfied with those four, so I made up one off the top of my head, and I said, E, the cats rode motor scooters. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah, and I do this all the time to see if they're paying attention and to get a chuckle out of them. So we had, like, they, they followed the people, the people took them with them, and then I said, E, the cats rode motor scooters to the different continents. And my kids were like, Miss Parsons, there's not even an E option on here. I was like, yes, there is. It's right there. Cats rode motor scooters. And they're like, they didn't have motor scooters back then, Miss Parsons. <laughs> I said, yes, they did. The cats rode the motor scooters. Can't you just picture the little cats on the motor scooters driving from continent to continent? Yes, it's E. Motor scooters, cats on motor scooters. And they're just like, Miss Parsons, there's no E. And cats can't ride motor scooters. Well, then my student, I'll, I'll call her um, Penelope. Uh, Penelope is frantically raising her hand, frantically. And Penelope is a tiny little girl. So she's raising her hand frantically. And I was like, yes, yes, Penelope, what, what do you need? She unzips her jacket and shows me her shirt. On her shirt are three motor scooters, and on the last motor scooter is a cat. No way. I totally. I will, I'm will. i not making this up. I have a picture to prove it of her shirt. There are three motor scooters, and on the third motor scooter is a cat driving it. Wow. Talk about random. Completely random, but still. If that doesn't show that intuition exists, I don't know what will. Wow, that is that is really, really funny. Talk about coincidence. Yeah, and so I didn't even see the shirt ahead of time because she was wearing a hoodie over it. Wow. It, speaking of random things that sound, um, I uh, I went thrift shopping with a friend of mine earlier today, and uh, I we went to the store that had just the most weirdest kind of clothes, and one of them was a zombie dress. Like the dress was kind of like had like. It was, it was antique style, like, you know, kind of slightly puffy sleeves and, you know, just regular skirt. But it had, it had heads on, like, you know, Audrey Hepburn and uh, Marilyn Monroe, a couple of other, like, semi-famous actors and actresses, but they were all, like, zombified. Like, they were all green faces with, like, you know, rotting flesh on it. It was the most random thing I'd ever seen. I could just see one of your students wearing a zombified shirt and you calling out a question, being like, oh, you know, don't you know that Marilyn Monroe Audrey Hepburn really didn't die? They just turned to zombies. And it's like... Uh, uh, Mandy, look what I'm wearing. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's what I'm talking about, these these coincidences. That is just, it's like one of those freaky mind-reading tricks that people who can do that kind of stuff try out for on those shows like America's Got Talent. You know, it's just like not only was her shirt motor scooters, it was a cat on a motor scooter. Wow. It's That's... just way too detailed, you know, just way too detailed to be random. Wow, just imagine that. Cats on motor scooters. Hmm. Yeah, I, I told my friend. I was like, holy cow. That's crazy. That's hilarious. Absolutely. So we've got some news to talk about this week, and I hope that you have brought some interesting stuff to the table as well. Yeah, I brought some interesting things. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what's been, what has been going on the last few days um, before we get right into the news, because so, you know, I had some really interesting things happened the last few days. Go for it. Take it away. Okay. So as you know, most of you know, I've been in the job search for oh, probably about a couple of months now. Um, and when I, when I got a, when I got my first initial job since moving here, I was extremely dissatisfied. Um, I was upset most days coming home, feeling very, um, you know, very left out, feeling like a failure. I have, you know, since then I have been searching very, very hard and I'm, you know, happy to announce that on Friday, uh, after an interview, which, you know, is a whole crazy story in and of itself, I was offered a position at the company that I have been trying to get for the last couple of months. So I was very, uh, very glad to get that job. So yay. Oh, yay. Totally. Oh, I'm so excited for you. I know that it's got to feel like it felt when I got my teaching job. It was a huge relief for sure. And what's funny is that this company that I had been interviewing for, I already had, um, like five other interviews with them, but you get this, they were all for different positions within the company. And the interview before this most recent one I had, 
um, I talked to these two gentlemen, and they were looking at me and then looking at my resume and telling me that I was overqualified for, for the position. And I, and before I could say anything, he said, no, not, not that that's a bad thing. He's like, we don't want you to think that's a bad thing. We just think that this particular position right here, uh, you know, would make you tired, would make you fall asleep. And I I finally, um, you know, looked at the book and I said, I'll be perfectly honest. I said, I did apply for a couple positions for the company, but I did not particularly apply for this one. The HR staffing lady uh, did refer me over here. And they both nodded and said that there had been a bit of a disconnect from HR um, because they were you know, trying to get a bunch of positions filled. So, you know, that kind of threw me off. So, like I said, this last interview, it was kind of intimidating because, uh, it was two interviews back to back. It was one at one thirty and another one at two, and I'm kind of thinking, oh, this is really intimidating. And I was feeling very burnt out. I was feeling a little bit depressed because I seemed to have gotten nowhere. So, so I was telling my partner, I was just like, well, I think I'm just going to be, just you know cancel my interviews and just wait back on other ones. And he kind of looked at me like, are you crazy? He's like, you just should go. It's a, it's, a, it's a double interview. You really should go. I I think this is really good for you. And I said, all right, and not only was I nervous about the whole double interview thing, I was just feeling very overwhelmed because, like I said, I had applied for four or five other positions and got nothing. Um, but needless to say, the interview went very well. And as soon as I got home, I got a call offering me the position that I had just interviewed for. So I definitely did impress uh, him. And, you know, to think if I hadn't listened to my partner, I you know, probably would not have gone in the first place. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Congratulations to you. There's nothing like knowing that your financial woes and troubles are about to lift up and be thrown out the window. Yes. Um, unfortunately, the position that I accepted uh, is a bit of a pay cut, but I you know, do understand that going into this new field that to expect some sort of a pay cut. Uh, the company that I work with, though, uh, is you know, they're known for moving pretty fast, and the people that I have been talking to, including one of my friends, really likes positions there. Uh, so there's definitely lots of room for improvement. So I'm sure within the next six months, 12 months, that I could be looking at even more salary. So I'm pretty excited about that. And another thing that I wanted to mention is that when you know, the uh, HR lady was offering me the position, she said, oh, I hope you go out and celebrate this weekend. And I told, and I already had planned to go out the very next day to Bar Harbor or Bahaba, as the natives call it, yes. up in Maine, which was about six hours away. So it was nice to be able to go away on vacation and be able to know that when I, you know, I don't start until the 15th, but it's nice knowing that all of my hard work was paying off. Absolutely. And tell me, was it not beautiful up there? It was really, really beautiful. Now, um, I used to live in Maine, not not in Bar Harbor, further up north. But when when me and my friend were getting closer to Bar Harbor, I started getting emotional because I could start smelling the the salt the salty Atlantic, like I could smell the shore. And I was just like, wow, this this is home for me. This is this is home. And it was just, it was amazing because when you go up when we were driving into Bar Harbor, there's a golf course called Pirates called Pirate Cove. And what's really funny is that there was a Pirates Cove where I lived in, when I lived in South Dakota as a little girl. So that was just like, whoa. <laughs> that was a very crazy experience. But, yes, we stayed in a really nice cottage area that was about five minutes away from town. So that was really nice to be able to get away from, you know, the traffic and the crowds. Uh, <laughs> funny thing is, is that when my friend and I went to go out to eat, my friend is very, um, for lack of a better word, I'll say derpy. Uh she gets creeped out very easily. So I ordered a lobster because lobster was relatively well priced and she refused to look at it at all we're eating. She put up a menu between us that she did not have to see me eat it. Wow. I, of course you go to Maine and you get lobster. Who doesn't eat lobster in Maine? Oh, she is like, okay, I'm kind of a picky eater myself because there's several things that I won't eat, but she's like, she won't eat anything unless it's like a burger and fries. Like, she won't eat sushi. She won't eat seafood. She can't really, she doesn't like anything spicy. So, you know, no Thai or Indian food. It was just, it was just like, all right. And on the subject of lobster, um, we all know the Mainites or Maniacs or whatever we want to call them love their lobster because across the street, is a place called Bill and Bob's Chocolate Emporium, and they have lobster ice cream. I don't know how I would feel about that. I had a taste. And the verdict? Not something that I would definitely have a scoop of. 
I think I think at first that was my reaction to salted caramel ice cream, but the more that I had of it, the more I really really loved it. Oh, I love salted caramel. And I do too now. It just it just took a while. Now I will say this: I had my first observation yesterday. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh yeah. The assistant principal came in um, off of a checklist. There were only two things that weren't. Um, complete the way that they needed them to be, but they were so minor. They they saw what they needed to see in my classroom. They saw it happen. So um, it was good. It was good. It went it went really, really well. It uh, went better than the few weeks ago that I had because I, didn't I talk about on the air how I'd had just a horrible day and how administration... You aside, yeah. Yes, yes, that was it. And the same woman came in and observed me because she is the administration for my grade and it went a lot better this time. A lot better. So it was, a, it was a positive visit and as a new teacher, you know, I'm just going to have to remember the fact that they're going to be in my room a lot because they want to make sure that I am successful. It just is unnerving when somebody's watching you teach. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm really, really glad to hear that it went over really well. I know it's super um, frustrating having that kind of cloud over you, but knowing that you've got the justification that you're doing the right thing and that you have positive feedback, it's just, you know, just keep, keep doing what you're doing. So I'm glad to hear that. Absolutely, and thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Now, speaking about positive feedback, um, before I get into our next topic anyway, I do want to remind people that you can call in, share your thoughts, share your comments, ask your questions, share a topic, uh, whatever you'd like to do. We appreciate phone calls. You can call in at 347-324-3704, and we'll Ask, you know, answer your questions. Well, you can chime in on the subject. Whatever you want to do, we appreciate the company. Or if you want to, there is a chat room at freedomizerradio.com. I'm in the chat room right now. If you go to freedomizerradio.com, there's a little t- a chat tab off to the side that says chat room. Click on it, create a name, come in and join me because I think I'm the only one in there right now. And so I'm kind of lonely in the chat room even though I have – really good company on the air with me. Uh, I do want to remind people also that if you missed tonight's show or do not listen to it in its entirety, you can listen to it tomorrow on Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube, and that is from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. So there are a multitude of ways to, to catch us and to catch up with us. So I hope that you all will listen. Now, I came across an article, and I did talk about this article on Unity Evolved, which is the podcast that I do with Ken the Liberty Phoenix and our friend Hefland and another friend of ours named Brian Socrates. And my angle on the show, I get my own segment, um, my angle on the show is pretty much, we call it voluntary education. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is how to include voluntarism in in my classroom, how to uh, teach with the voluntarist ways. Sometimes it's just teaching skills that will help you promote the voluntarist idea. And I came across this article uh, about rice. And I know you're just like, what in the world does that have to do with anything voluntary? Um, but the fact is that the whole spin I put on this was that there's, it's a big deal with the power of positive speech and the power of positive thought. And there's this article that says that there is scientific proof that thoughts and intentions can alter the world around us. This scientist, I guess he's a researcher, an alternative healer, not really a scientist, um, has he has done these scientific experiments where he put rice in two different jars, and it was the cooked rice in both jars, and on one jar he wrote, I love you. And on another jar, he wrote, I hate you. Or oh, my. And he had, was it? No, no, no. It was, one said, thank you, and one said, you fool. The picture says, I hate you, I love you. But he said, um, you fool, and thank you. And every day, he would have school children come in and read the labels on the jars when they passed by the jars. And after 30 days, the rice in the container with positive thoughts had barely changed, while the other was moldy and rotten. 
Wow. Now, people might say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, is that he also had another experiment uh, where he used ice crystals. He looked at water molecules before he offered a prayer, and it, it just looked like mush. It looked like icy mush. After he offered a prayer to the water molecules, they took the shape of what we would look at as a typical snowflake. When he said thank you, again, it took the shape of a beautiful snowflake. When he said you make me sick, I will kill you, it looked like a blob. It just was, it didn't, it was congealed, it looked congealed. And then when he showed love and appreciation to the water molecules and froze them, again, you got the snowflake pattern. Wow, that's awesome. This this really resonated with me um, just because of the fact that in my life, I try to live the best way possible. I try to live bringing joy and happiness to others. And I say, you know, I live trying to make people happy, but that makes it sound like I'm trying to, to please them. I'm not trying to please anybody. I just like brightening everybody's day. And... It's it's like you said a while ago in reference to your ponies. You said you're Pinkie Pie because you try to make everybody happy. Right. You live to you know you live to have them smile and you know and show kindness. And it's true. If somebody makes me mad and I'm in the right frame of mind, you know I don't <laughs> seek, I don't seek revenge. I try to turn the other cheek. Uh, I don't want to get mad at them. I I prefer to try to talk things out with people. Um, I, I just I live to bring joy to others, and if I am at a store and I can afford it, I will pay it forward, and I will secretly purchase the items for the person behind me. I've done that maybe two or three times, and I, I leave before I get to talk to them, but a few times they've chased me down in the parking lot to thank me. Um, I just tell them, pay it forward. You know, make somebody's day a lot brighter, and... I've learned a lot about myself in the past few weeks. I've had more than one person tell me, and even some of them living far, far away, that they can feel that I have a positive light, that I radiate a goodness, and that I'm a magnet when it comes to people. People are drawn to me. They tell me that being around them just makes them feel better. And I just... I think that's amazing. I think a lot of that, if that's what they feel, it's because of what I say and how I conduct myself and what I try to bring to others' lives. Because otherwise, you can't feel people through a computer. Not that I can imagine, but again, I'm strong into intuition, so I guess I guess I believe you can. But um, yeah, you know, so I've learned a lot about myself, and this experiment, I think, just radiated what. I feel all the time. We send words into the atmosphere. We send feelings, emotions, and vibes into the atmosphere, and people pick up on those. Mm -hmm. And I think we do have the power and ability to change somebody's life for the better or uh, change their day at least. And, you know, my philosophy in life is to change the life of everybody I meet for the better, even if I only get to talk to them for five minutes. That's really powerful. I mean, I'm... I'm so glad to hear about that. And you know, and I always, and I always tell people that you, you know it goes with the old saying is that you're going to be able to attract more you're going to be able to attract more flies with honey than vinegar. So it can be really really hard to be. Not, I wouldn't necessarily say nice because you don't necessarily have to be nice to get far you know, far ahead. But, but don't be rude. I mean, it's you know, like I said, if you're being rude, you're being the vinegar, you're, you know, shooing, you're shooing things away. No one wants to be around vinegar. I mean, I, you know, just, you know, treat people with respect and don't tread on them, so to speak. I mean, you don't have to be fake a smile if you're not having a good day. But, you know, if someone just sh- you shoves past you or doesn't hold the door open, I mean, just, you know, don't, you know, don't be rude to people. You know, treat people with respect. Treat everyone how you'd want to be. And it's just... It goes without saying, you know, your day's going to be better. You're not perpetuating the situation. It's true. It's absolutely true. And it can be really, really tough to be nice to people. I mean, for, I remember I was taking a um, flight home. This was last summer, and I had been flying all day. And I had already been up for about 24 hours because I didn't get any sleep the night before. But um, our, 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 and I had been delayed about five times while I was waiting in Denver to go home. And 
at 1 a.m., they finally, at midnight, they finally boarded us. So I'm on the plane by roughly at about 1 o'clock because we all know how boarding can take forever. And at 1 a.m., they announced that uh, they had to cancel the flight because the pilots had been flying for 18 hours straight and they, they couldn't fly anymore. So there I am stuck in the middle of Denver airport at 1 a.m. in the morning. Nothing is open. I'm with, you know, probably, what, 100 other people that are cranky. And I'm just sitting there just being patient, just knowing that they're going to do everything they can. And you've got, you know, those jerks in the crowd that are yelling at the um, airline attendants to, you know, hurry up and what's taking so long and, you know, I'm going to be late and you know, just making all these threats. And it's just like you're not, you're not helping the situation. You really think you're yelling is going to be any better. You know, just sit back. They know what they're doing. They're, you know, not, they're going to get everybody home. It may take some time, but, you know, don't, don't antagonize the situation. It just, it, it causes you know, everyone to feel grumpy and not get anything done. So it's just. You know, if you can't be nice, just, you know, sit back and don't say anything and let, you know, and let things work themselves out. You know, it does, it's not worth it to be rude to people. It really is not. No, it's not. And, you know, I was on a, a bus from uh, Pocatello to Salt Lake City, and the bus started breaking down. It overheated, I think. And we were oh, on yeah. our way to the Salt Lake City airport so that I could go home when I took my trip. And it started to overheat. I called my parents. And I said, oh, yeah, the bus just broke down. And they're like, what? And my stepmom said, you go tell that bus driver you need to get to the airport. And I said, I'm <laughs> sure he's doing everything he can. And really, at this point, what can I do? I can tell him that. But what's he going to do, make the bus sprout wings? No, he's not. I was like, so I'm just going to wait this out. It'll be fine. I will make my trip. And, you know, I did make my trip. <laughs> but I'm just like, what are you going to do? You know, and on the, way, on, yeah. the, on the way to Colorado, when I was driving or getting to Idaho, um, I came across people. I didn't – this airline was a foreign notion to me. This is a new airline. I've never heard of it before. I never, never took a trip on it. Um, and I didn't know their baggage procedures. I had too many bags, and I didn't have the money to pay for the bags. Well, in Atlanta, they made some calls and said, you know, just let her on. Just let her go. And they worked it out. Well, I get to Denver, and there's this nasty, nasty man going, you have to fit that under the seat in front of you. And if you don't, I'm, you cannot put it in the overhead compartment. And if you do, I will come on, and I will charge you. Oh, my God. Oh, he was nasty. He was horribly nasty. And I'm like, what do you accomplish by treating somebody that way? The only thing he made me want to do was write a nasty message to the people at his company and tell them, I'll never fly with you again. Did you ask him who pissed in a cereal that morning? Because that probably would have been a much more appropriate answer. Oh, I probably should have, but I, I didn't want to push buttons and I didn't sure, want to yeah. push my luck. <laughs> he would make me a target after that. Um, yeah. But he was just one of the most miserable people. And like, you know what? If you don't like the industry, don't work in it. I know. It's, just, it's so, like, yes, jobs are very scarce to come by, and they can be very hard to come by, as, you know, I've experienced the last few months diligently looking for a job. But, you know, honestly, if it's just, if it's going to make you cranky, please, by all means, don't put yourself through that and go find something else. It's true. And I'll tell you, there is a training company. I don't know if they have a program out, but I found their little uh, brochure their plan that they pitch to people when they want people to accept this program. It's all about positive thinking in the workplace. And it says the benefits this program can deliver for you and your organization when you learn how to positively communicate. It reduces stress. It helps eliminate the stress of negative interactions at work. You get more done because you trust people, you accentuate the positive, and you redirect bad emotions or bad feelings. And others stay positive because of that. Um, and it just plain feels better. And then for the organization itself, you're increasing the likelihood that your best for performers are going to stick around because they feel they're in a positive environment. And you know, there are people out there who work for companies that they might not like their job, but they, they'll keep it because they do work around amazingly cool people. So you know it doesn't it doesn't hurt and it says it increases creativity and innovation i don't know about you but if i'm feeling good i want to find some more positive ways to make that feeling stick around and help increase productivity absolutely i mean if you're in a good mood you definitely want you have motivation to you know better yourself and 
you know, maybe you actually want to get that cleaning done, unless, you know, the clean makes you absolutely miserable. But if you're in a good mood, it's like, you know what? I need to clean right now. I mean, and it can definitely change how good of a job you do cleaning, for sure. Absolutely. It also improves service to the team members and customers, and it inspires passion and boosts performance. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I used to work for Starbucks, and for the time I was there, I was there for four years, um, the, the time I was there, they did so much for the partners and they did so much for the people there that even though I had some issues with the local management, um, I the company overall treated us so well that it made it worthwhile to stick around. We were certainly passionate about it. So I can understand that. I can understand that. And I think now from what I understand what they're what they've done and the changes they've made have impacted the quality and turned it into more of a business instead of a family. But for a while I was there, I, I got that feeling of be- feeling of belonging to something bigger than myself. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Yeah, so people, the main point that I was trying to make on Monday that I didn't even get to because we just sidetracked off of uh, making the world a better place and putting positive vibes in the world is that when you are trying to promote the voluntarist ideas, It is a lot easier to talk to people when you're not screaming in their face, telling them they're wrong, telling them why you should believe in your current system is not working and you are just, you're just a sheep. You know, if you are saying these things to people, it's no wonder they don't want to talk to us. It's no wonder they don't want to listen to us. And it's no wonder you're not convincing them of anything. It's because you speak to them inappropriately. And it's so hard sometimes. I know it is really hard to talk to somebody about a belief system or talk to somebody about what you believe in without getting upset that they're believing in the wrong thing in your opinion. Mm-hmm. But if you're trying to talk to somebody about political beliefs, about uh, how they should live, about religious beliefs, if you don't go into it with a positive attitude and talk to them and treat them like a human being and at least that you respect their ideas, even if you don't agree with them, you won't get anywhere. Absolutely. And treat you know, treat everyone with respect. Like I said, it's not worth it to be a jerk. No, it's not worth it to be a jerk. So there's there are a lot of benefits to talking to people positively and being good to people. Um, so on that note, I think we are going to go ahead and take a break. And when we get back, we will let you take the floor. Woo. All right, we'll be right back. Hi, I have a question for you. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do you want a company that provides good quality ingredients and does not use artificial sweeteners? Look no further. Genesis Pure has a complete lineup of health and wellness, sports performance, and superfruit juices like noni and mangosteen that are pure, wild harvested with no binders and fillers. The philosophy is simple. Cleanse the body of toxins, balance the body's pH and hormones, and build the body nutritionally. Every race has a starting line, and yours is cleanse, balance, build. Sign up for at least a 25% discount and include auto ship of at least one product to start building up 20% back in points for free products. It's a win-win. Help fund our operation while you fund your body nutritionally. Start your journey at genesispure.com backslash Freedomizer Health. Again, that is genesispure.com backslash Freedomizer Health. I'm not a lab rat. I'm not a lab rat. My family is not a bunch of lab rats. I am not a lab rat. Thanks, but no thanks. 80% of the processed food in America has been genetically modified. That's GMOs. That's GMOs. You can't even tell what foods contain GMOs at the grocery store. Because no GMO food labels are required. That makes us the guinea pigs. Hmm, sounds like an experiment to me. GMOs are scary. It's up to you. You're an adult. You can vote. I can't vote because I'm a kid. Vote yes. Vote yes. Please vote yes. Can't I cook you? Freedomizer, you have a voice. How will you vote? when initiatives are added to the ballot in your state.
thank you for tuning in to Freedomizer Radio, where we have a 24-7 chat room where you can come and share what's going on in the world with people of like mind. Anything and everything against the New World Order. Dial 347-324-3704 to catch our live show. Beginning at 9 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time, Monday through Friday till midnight, and 9 to 9 on Saturday and Sunday. Take us to the beach. Take us to the park. Take us on a walk with the dog. Only on Freedomizer Radio. Want to spread awareness to your neighbors, family, and friends about what is going on in our country today? It may be things you already know, like the large number of FEMA camps spread around this country to lock up citizens like you and me. What legislators are doing to strip states and people of their sovereign rights. Or legislation giving states the power to force vaccinate under a declared state of emergency. Do your neighbors understand what is going on? William Lewis Films offers the perfect tools to inform our population about this government's tyrannical shift from a constitutional republic to a despotic democracy. Films like 911 Ripple Effect, Beyond Treason, One Nation Under Siege, Washington You're Fired, Camp FEMA, Enemy of the State, Don't Tread on Me, Blood of Patriots, The Ron Paul Uprising, even 911 in Plain Sight, Williams First Production, are all available at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Get your DVDs today at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Educate against the police state. And we're back. I hope there are listeners out there in Radio Land who are listening to the PM show on Freedomizer Radio. Here with me, your host, Mandy Parsons, and her co-host, Danica the Great. I do want to remind everybody that you can call in. You can share your thoughts. You can share your opinions. You can ask us questions. And you can plain out tell us we suck if you want to. We'll try to convince you we don't, and probably we'll do a good job of it. But... You can call us at 347-324-3704. And also, if you want to share some love, we highly, 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 highly would love to hear that you all love us. So feel free to call in, share your opinions, questions, comments. Come tell, us yeah, you, right. tell us you love us. Danica's, Danica's saying something. What are you saying, Danica? Oh, I was just going to say, come at me, bro. But unfortunately, I successfully interrupted you. So I do apologize, but come at me, bro. And don't tase me, bro. That too. <laughs> Don't take me, bro. Yeah, so call in at 347-324-3704. We welcome your calls. We welcome your comments. And most of all, we welcome the radio love. Also, you can join us in the chat room at freedomizerradio.com. When you go there, there is a little tab off to the side. It says chat room, create a name, add a picture, and come talk to me. I'm lonely in the chat room. I'm, I'm all by myself. So, Thank you guys for come join me there. And again, if you're just now tuning in and you want to hear the beginning of the show, because who doesn't want to hear the beginning of the PM show, uh, you can go to YouTube tomorrow from 4 to 6 Eastern where we will be broadcasting the PM show on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I hope people will tune in. And I know it's, that's becoming wildly popular and successful. So good on you, Michael Shanklin. Good on you. So... Before we left, we were talking about the power of positive words and emotions. And now we're going to jump into Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Don't you love Ooh, it? Such a, such a topic change. Oh, my. Don't you love how I bridged that? Um, you know, so for the past few weeks, I've been talking about how I've been teaching my students the truth about Abraham Lincoln. I'm not really stretching so much because the curriculum that I have and the materials that I, I've been using, they are actually promoting the ideas that I'm teaching to my kids. There are many of the things that we've been using to teach the Civil War that say he was not a good man. It was pretty much retaliation that caused him to free the slaves because he only freed them in the, in the southern states. If you had a state such as, I think Missouri was one, that had, it was a slave state, but they sympathized with the North during the Civil War, he let them keep their slaves. So people are like, oh, he freed the slaves. Well, he didn't free all of them. And if you go back and read the Emancipation Proclamation, which the schools don't enforce the students to read in its entirety, then you will learn that he did not free all the slaves. And when you find out why he really did, he comes off as a huge jerk. Yes, slavery is a bad thing, absolutely. But we're stuck in the quandary of setting the slaves free, who were the main 
dri- driving force and producers of the cotton industry in the South because they had slaves to pick the cotton and sell the cotton. He frees the slaves, and he kills the industry in the South. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. It was retaliation. And yes, it's a good thing he freed them. Nobody should be enslaved, but at the same time, he did it not for the good moral reason of it's wrong, but because he was retaliating. Yeah, I mean, we're we're taught so much in history that Abe Lincoln, honest Abe, just you know wanted to free the slaves. He went through all these jumps and hurdles as a businessman. Like he lost, you know, his ch- he lost all his children. He lost so many of his businesses. He failed horribly in elections, and you know, before finally becoming the president of the United States. But you know, we're not, you know, we're just we're not taught about the dark things that happen in history with our own presidents. And I really wish they wouldn't hide that from us. I know that I, it was hidden from me for quite a while. And I just found out about this maybe three years ago. I took U.S. history in elementary school. I took U.S. history in middle school. I took U.S. history in high school. I took U.S. history in college. I did not learn about any of this until my friend sat me down, a liberty friend, if you will, sat me down and said, have you ever read the Real Emancipation Proclamation? And I said, no. She goes, take a look at this. And she pulls it up on her phone, and she, I said, that says that he freed the slaves in the South because they fought against the North. She said, that's exactly what it says. And if you read his memoirs, he wrote in his memoirs that he did not care for the Negroes. He just wanted them freed so that they would vote for him in the next election. So he sacrificed the lives of thousands of Americans so that he could get re-elected, which leads me to believe that he was just a typical part of the political machine and agenda, and he was going to carry out their agenda, and so they were willing to have him elected again. Wow. It is crazy what you learn when you actually dig deep. So I told, I had a group of students with me teaching small group lesson, and we were reading, and uh, when I was talking to one of them, I said, he's he's not a good man. And another kid who's a, a black child in my class, he goes, so wait a minute, there were lots of black people who fought in the Civil War for the cause of the, of the North. I said, yes. He goes, are you saying he hated black people? I said, I can't say that. Because he was trying to lead back to the point of what I said about sacrificing sacrificing lives of thousands of Americans. And he tried to make the point, are you saying he hated black people? And I was like, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all, because think about it. I said, yes, he, he allowed many black people to perish in the war, too, because the war was not necessary. But remember, too, for, for all the black people that were fighting, there were more white people fighting who were losing their lives, too. So I wouldn't say he hated black people. I would say, in general, he was a miserable man who was not a good person. He killed a lot of people or allowed a lot of people to get killed. And my other student, she threw down her pencil and she goes, I hate him now. I don't like Abraham Lincoln anymore. Oh, my goodness. And she also was a black student. You know, I try to I'm trying to let them know it's it's not a race thing. And I told them what the memoirs said. I'm not telling these students anything that they can't look up themselves. The problem is the people who write this stuff they take the chance of writing it knowing that the kids are not going to look it up, that they're going to buy whatever it is we feed them because the curriculum says that we have to. But that doesn't challenge their thinking. That doesn't encourage them to find out the truth. And I asked my kids flat out, I was like, we weren't there. Do we really know what happened in history? And they said, no. I said, absolutely. We know what they tell us, but that's why we go and we do our own research. And I was talking to another woman one day who said, yeah, they don't teach you that 7% of the slaveholders were African-American, do they? I said, are you serious? She's like, dead serious. She's like, the point I'm trying to make is that the winners write the history. Yeah, and it's, it's so very true. There's so many things that they don't teach you in school. I mean, another one was Christopher Columbus about how, um, you know, how he stole thousands and thousands of coin to go and, you know, he made slaves of all of the Indians that were over there. It's just, it, it's crazy just what happens when you find out several things about the, uh, about things that they don't tell you. 
Um, speaking, you know, speaking of that, I, you know, had some more news to talk about for school because I remember you were talking a few weeks ago um, about how you have been teaching your students how to participate in voluntary interactions and that you've been having kind of a weird time trying to talk to them about the Pledge of Allegiance and other things. Is that right? Um, not a weird time talking to them about it. I did tell one teacher the truth about the flag, which was that the Pledge of Allegiance was created just to sell more flags. It was propaganda to increase the sale of flags. And the original salute to during the Pledge of Allegiance was the same thing they did to Hitler back in the Nazis did to Hitler. They raised their arm in the air. So that was very disturbing. And knowing the connection between that and raising the hand to Hitler, they went ahead and said, hey, let's do the hand over the heart. Now, when the pledge is on the screen in my classroom, I stand up for it. I no longer put my hand over my heart. And if my kids follow suit and stand up, okay, sure. But do I make them? No. And if they stay seated, I don't make them get up. And that's good. And uh, the reason why I want to bring that up is that I found a very um, very interesting article that was discussed about on Free Talk Live the other night, and I knew that you were talking about it and thought that I would share it with you. Um, it's by uh, it's from Psychology Today, so I mean it's a pretty big, pretty big magazine. Uh, so basically, uh, it starts off with just as you said, the original pledge was eerily similar to the Nazi salute. So uh, eventually, it was changed to hand over heart. But the article goes, "Are you a bad American if you refuse?" To recite the Pledge of Allegiance? Are you a bad parent if you encourage your child to opt out of the Pledge of Allegiance in school? Not at all. In fact, setting out the Pledge of Allegiance and encouraging your children to do so as well can be ser- seen as an affirmation of certain important values that are sadly lacking in modern America. One could even argue that setting up the Pledge is itself a noble act of patriotism. Or at least those who are opt out are by no means any less patriotic than those who participate. Uh, and also, the right to refuse participation in the Pledge has been guaranteed by the United States Supreme Court. So um, just so that if you're threatened by anyone about, you know, getting sued for not taking it or going to get fined for it, uh, there is no legal ramification for doing that. So if you're ever in caught in that situation, just let them know that it's been guaranteed that nothing will happen to you if you do that. So it would be a mistake to assume that the Pledge of Allegiance is an ex- exercise that somehow unites you know, all good citizens. Most Americans, liberal, moderate, conservatives, are decent and loyal citizens who appreciate at some level of the nation's core values, freedom, equal rights, democracy, and the fundamental principles embedded in the Constitution. They may often disagree on how to define and apply these values, but simply the nature of a pluralistic, open society. With such a diverse population and a wide range of viewpoints, it shouldn't be surprising that many see the level of pledge exercise. Um, so at a minimum, pen- Parents should talk to their kids about the pledge, about what it means, what it doesn't mean, and even its history. For starters, kids should understand that the exercise is voluntary, just like you've been doing with your kids, voluntary, um, because many schools don't inform this, of, of this, inform them of this. So obviously your school is one of them that probably hasn't told them, hey, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, let's see. And whether individual children decide to or not, kids should understand that non-participation is not unphreatic or disrespectful in any way. The reverse side of the same coin will point out that participation doesn't even make one a patriot. Uh, so I mean, another thing that people struggle with would be the, uh, you know, some families may not believe that the nation is under God, for example, and others may not truly feel that we really provide liberty and justice for all in America, because you and I both know and have seen over the years that, you know, there is you know, liberties are taken away every single day, and you know, justice is it really justice in many in many Supreme Court cases? It's just, it's certainly a huge question. Well, I know that, for instance, I've had students in the past who were Jehovah's Witnesses, and he were one child would not stand up, and he was like, "I'm, I'm not allowed." And I said, "And why is that?" He's like, "I'm a Jehovah's Witness, and we oh. don't worship anything but God." And by saying a pledge to a flag, you're pledging your life to a piece of cloth. He said, I'm not allowed to do that, and I won't do that. My religious beliefs prohibit me from doing that. And when I was in school, in middle school, I remember the teacher flat out saying, Who's not, who can't say the pledge? And at first, some kids were snickering because they thought, man, who doesn't know the pledge by now? But she's no, right. she said, no, like, who cannot say the pledge because of religious reasons or other reasons? You know, and, and nobody 
stood up or said anything. Um, Not until I became a substitute did I actually encounter somebody who explained to me uh, what it was that they were not allowed to stand up for. And it was the fact that he said, yeah, if we stand up and say the pledge, we are worshiping and dedicating our lives to a piece of cloth. And again, you know, we only worship God. That's a very, you know, that's an excellent point. I mean, you know, and again, we, we in America do want to promote the ideas of, you know, freedom of religion. You're free to be Jehovah's Witness, the, you know, atheist, even though that's not technically a religion. Um, you know, you're allowed to be a Buddhist. You're allowed to be a Baptist. You know, anything that you want. So kudos for him. And you know, it's, you know, it can definitely be really frightening to stand up and say, hey, I'm different, and this is why. And you know, that's that's great that he was able to stand up for them. And, and that you know, brings up to uh, some of the issues that this article was saying that are worth discussing and really going over it. Um, So there's the the loyalty oath problem. And no matter how much you love your country, you could question the wisdom of any recitation that essentially amounts to a loyalty oath. To be good citizens must we visibly and publicly pledge our allegiance, and must even children do so on a daily basis. It's interesting that the founding fathers never felt it desirable to promote such loyalty recitations from citizens. In fact, the pledge wasn't even written until 1892, a full century after the founding era. The framers, as men of reason with enlightenment values, would most likely have been aghast at the other citizens being expected to regularly recite a loyalty pledge. So, you know, a lot of people don't understand that so many pieces of the Pledge of Allegiance, such as the under God part, didn't come in until centuries, years later, as the original. So, you know... Again, we're finding out more and more of these values are coming true. And it's just like, no, that wasn't what it was like in the 1700s. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up for part of this was the, uh, promoting nationalism. We can love our country while still being skeptical of nationalism. We can agree that America is a marvelous place from sea to sea and sea, and that the principles upon it in which it was founded are worthy of exaltation. But that doesn't mean we should constantly encourage widespread feelings of nationalism. History shows that national pride in America and elsewhere can be overdone, and it can also lead to militarization and a diminished appreciation of outsiders. Nationalism can be seen as a manifestation of the human tendency towards tribalism, and such we are so great thinking is hardly an impulse that should be encouraged. Beyond our borders are fellow human beings whose worth and dignity should be not disregarded. And such, maybe we shouldn't instill our children with a daily dose of national superiority. You know, that, you know, that's a you know that's a huge thing to think about because, you know, allow me to quote a part of, you know, what was it, Team America World Police or something like that? Like, America, F, yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think everything you just said is, is eerily the truth. I mean, we have this issue now. We're talking about police militarization and too much patriotism and people believing they're doing something good by hating cultures from around the world. We have gotten very skewed in our thoughts and we've, we've gone way off the path. Yes, we have. Um, you know, I'm, I do apologize. This article is a little long, so I'm trying to wrap it up as you know best I can and just kind of talk about some of the main roots, mostly about, you know, the bullet points that psychology is pointing out. Um, but the pledge also has racist and sexist roots. Uh, liberty and justice are fine values, but they are hardly a comprehensive statement of important American values. So when Francis Bellamy, a socialist, originally wrote the pledge in 1882, he considered including the values of equality and fraternity in their resuscitation, but he was discouraged from doing so. It seems that many Americans, particularly those in leadership positions, were opposed to equality for women and African Americans, so inclusion of values would have been too controversial. Thus, by excluding those values, the pledge as it appears today reflects not so subtle an uh, attitude of racism and sexism. The reason not to, to pass on participating in it. So, you know, again, I remember I brought up um, some time ago talking about how racism is alive and well with the discussion of Freakonomics as well as the whole Ferguson shooting. You know, it, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance has racist and sexist roots. As you know, you, you know, as you as a woman working outside the home and me working outside the home, and that's certainly you know reason for me to be like, heck no, I'm not resetting that. Well, I can tell you this too. We had this discussion today. I was teaching a group. Uh, we were reading a passage about the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse and in the Civil War. Anybody who has studied the Civil War, I don't know how much they made you study it out in Idaho. I know that. When you study things, 
often it's regional. So, for instance, New England is going to study more of the effects of the American Revolution because that happened up there in New England. And, of course, we learn about it down here, but I'm sure we don't go nearly in depth, uh, as in depth as kids in New England do. Uh, oh, down, probably, yeah. You know, down here in Georgia, we talk about the Civil War. Georgia was a major state for the Civil War. So we're talking about how they were reconstructing after the war. And we're talking about the, K, the KKK. And the Ku Klux Klan came up because it's a part of history, unfortunately. Yeah. And the way they started to, out is still drastically different from the entity they are today. When the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were signed. The 13th Amendment was um, that slavery was outlawed completely. The 14th Amendment made blacks citizens, if I'm not mistaken, and the 15th Amendment gave blacks the right to vote. Um, They had the KKK start, what did they do? Um, They started intimidating black people from voting. And I had to explain to the kids that The KKK started out just as an entity to keep them from voting. Today's KKK hates anybody who's not white. And I told them, I was like, so this is what this evolved into. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. I had some astute children on my hands today because they said, wait, you're saying that they didn't like white women either. And I was like, okay, let's explore this. Let's explore this. Uh, I said when the pledge, when the Emancipation Proclamation, when all of that was written, it specifically was talking to white males. They did not treat, they did not want to treat blacks as human beings. Women were not treated as human beings. And part of the job of the KKK was to discourage people from, um, black people from owning land. You know, the Southerners were upset. They were angry. I said, guys, imagine this. Imagine that you were treated for years as lower than a human being, and all of a sudden you got the same level or the uh, concept of being on the same level as the white people who owned you. I said, so say that these men who looked at you as property, looked at you as less than human, now are supposed to be on the same level as you. How do you think they feel? And they're like, well they're, well, they're angry. They don't want that. They think they're better than those people. I said, yeah. that's exactly right. I was like, the, and those were just men. They didn't include the women because the women were not human beings either. I said, it's a, it's a huge, sticky situation, huge, sticky mess. But, I mean, it, that's, that's what it is. You know, it goes past the Pledge of Allegiance. It was like you said, sexist? Absolutely. Uh, when they were writing the Constitution. It did not apply to women. It did not apply apply to people of other cultures except for white landowning males. It's very true. And, you know, we, that's, unfortunately, that's just how it was back then because, you know, we adapted a lot of standards from Europeans. And, you know, I know to some degree the European culture is far more liberal about women these days. But, you know, it was pretty much, you know, the men were only able to, um, you know, if you owned land, you were allowed to vote, you were allowed to have property, but the women just didn't have anything. Blacks even more so. And you know, it took women also several centuries to get that right. You know, nineteen twenties where the you know, the women were um starving themselves, they were going on hunger strikes for the right to vote because you know, again, it's not their fault they're born women and women have proven over the years to be just as mentally capable as men with handling in many cases even slightly superior. You know, I'm not saying that women are better than men, but I'm certainly not saying that men are better than women either. But it was just, you know, it it was just crazy just for how long that women also had to fight to have the same rights. You know, you can definitely see the struggles from that from several different movies. One of them, um, I believe it's called Freedom Writers, uh, portrayed by Hilary Swank. Fantastic movie about the women's rights. In the, in, you know, nothing that you know on that mentioned about women's rights is that we're so easy to forget. And you know, not trying to go into a whole other subject, but you know, women in other countries just simply do not have anywhere in the amount that we do. I mean, even over in India, you know, women are constantly, you know, treated as properly, catcalled all the time, and treated for less than that. So, 
you know, at some point, maybe one day the women of India and other, you know, another country such as that will have equal rights. But, you know, even, you know, sexism and racism is alive and well here in America. It is. And I'll tell you about the women thing. It's it's funny because I just had a conversation today with somebody about the roles of women and how in my personal experiences, women have proven to be stronger than males. And I'm not trying to male bash here, but I mean, I have male friends who if their heart gets broken once, they recoil and they and they never survive. You know, they never try again. They never get over it. They never jump over that hurdle. And they let it sit there and fester. And they can't handle relationships because one person hurt them. But I know a, a number of, of women who if they've been hurt by a guy, we'll jump back on the horse and try again and Absolutely. try again and try again. And then we've got the uh, issue of women who are raising single children. Uh, they're raising, they're in a single parent household raising children. That's what I should say. Um, but these, these didn't exist. I think that the ideas about women's strength, they were perpetuated by society telling us, that we're weaker, telling us that we should be in a weaker role, that we're inferior to men. And again, not trying to bash men, but the only people who were putting these ideals on us were ourselves. Yes, absolutely. And you know, you are correct that women are more likely to get back and keep going. And you know, I've seen you know, tons of men just kind of really fall like it's just it's such an ego crash to have something bad happen to them and they just you know they it almost seems like they never seem to recover but women have just this crazy emotional and you know mental strength to just keep pressing on absolutely now you were talking about how racism is alive and well in america and i want to talk about this article uh, i think that our information tonight is a little different than what we usually cover. I mean, we're jumping around to a lot of social aspects tonight, and we're jumping around to a lot of um, people-oriented articles and society-oriented articles rather than the same political stuff we usually cover. And I think it's important to talk about this. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm really glad that we are. Um, I have an article here from five days ago. Uh, it's titled... Well, not titled, but it is filed under Crime, Georgia, Most Popular, and Race Relations. And the reason I'm reading this article is because it hits so close to home. Um, What happened is there was a 36-year-old man. His name was uh, Joshua Chalu, or Chalu. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, He walked out, apparently, of a gas station, and he was talking to himself and they came up and started asking him who he was talking to, and they started just attacking him. So they attacked him. They were they were repeatedly punching and kicking him, and he tried to escape them beating him up by backing onto the highway, and he got knocked to the ground by the attackers, and they knocked him unconscious. Now, if that's not bad enough, while he laid in the middle of the highway, he was hit by a car. Oh, my. And it, it killed him. He, he was the victim of a pointless hate crime. There was no re- rhyme or reason behind why they did it. And the incident, it says, was rep- initially reported as a hit-and-run death back in July when the incident occurred, but police realized what actually happened. Um, the person who hit him with a car turned themselves in, but they did not charge that person with a crime. They, the person didn't do anything. So they went after these teens. Now, we're we're going to have an issue here, you know, Nobody heard about this. I, I heard about this report uh, several months ago. The reason that I think I heard about it is it happened in a city called Mableton, Georgia. I live about 15 minutes from Mableton. Oh, wow. The, some of the schools in Mableton, I used to sub at the schools, which this is the big part that breaks my heart, is that the, the four guys who performed the crime, uh, they're, they're young guys. They are 19, 18, 18, and 18, which means that if these guys actually went to high school like they should have, I don't know what kind of students they were, of course, um, but if they actually went to school like they're supposed to, their chances of them having been in some of my classes could have been very likely. Yeah, definitely. Wow. So what 
happened is they arrested 19-year-old Jakari Strozier, 18-year-old Antonio Pass, 18-year-old Jonathan Anthony, and 18-year-old Kimonta Bonds, and charged all four with felony murder, aggravated assault, and violation of the Georgia Street Gang Act. So three out of four of them were charged. And here's here's the clincher, and this has been on everybody's minds lately. The young men who were charged are black, and their victim was white. Oh, of course. And that's why I said some people might not have heard about this. But, I mean, it's just – it's horrible. It's it's just terrible, you know. And they – like I said, three out of four were convicted. But – Chalu was taken to Grady Memorial. I won't even get started about Grady. That's a hospital in downtown Atlanta. I, I won't even get started. Um, but they pronounced him dead, and they're accused of gang violence because they actually do belong to the Reup gang, whichever that is. I'm not familiar with it because you know I'm so familiar with gangs as it is. Um, well, of course. Yeah, and have been arrested in in the past in connection to gang crimes. So three of the teens convicted, they face life in prison, and I just. It's pointless. It's heartless. It makes me so angry and upset, and it just makes me want to cry for the Chalu family. It's just, that's, oh, man, I agree. That that totally breaks my heart, too. So, you know, just an example of, of how you said racism is alive and well. I have a feeling they, the guy walking out of the convenience store who had been talking to himself was another black male. They chances are they probably would not have done this to him. It's just, it's so sad. And I just, I don't understand how people can be so judging of someone just based on the color of their skin. I mean, you know, they're, they're born that way. It's not, it's not their fault. They're born that way. I just, you know, what, what kind of childhood are they brought up in where they're just, you know, racist towards no, no good reason to, people of a certain color like i mean i mean everyone makes jokes about you know whites asians blacks i mean you know what you know i understand that we're all like a little bit stereotypical of each other's things but you know, to outright just hate someone and want to harm it's just it's absolutely heartbreaking and i don't see a solution anytime soon when you have a society that fosters these feelings and you have a society that fosters these ideas you know you're on a you're on a downward spiral there's not any recoil. There's not any coming back from this when your own president is perpetuating these thoughts. <laughs> you know, him talking about how Ukraine has all the rights to their borders um, from Russia, but you know, telling Israel they have no rights to their borders, and it's just like you can't pick and choose, Mr. President. I mean, a border shouldn't exist in the first place, but you know, you can't pick one country over the other. It, just, it doesn't work that way. You know, they're, you know, they're each nation. They each have their own right to their area. Well, it makes it hard for me to to hear that because of the fact that I have a new student in my class. And she, each of my students actually, had to write a paragraph about the person who they think is the most honest in the world. It could have been real. It could have been fake. It didn't matter. It was a redo subject assignment because the kids are not writing. They're actually making me upset about that. I'm trying to instill in them how writing can be a really fun thing because they could get to jot their thoughts down on paper. So we're working on this. But they had a sub last week, and they didn't do all the work with the substitute teacher. So I uh, I had them redo the paragraph on Monday. And we wrote the paragraph together so that they could have a modeled paragraph because, sadly enough, a lot of them don't know how to write paragraphs. And they had to do the honesty um, prompt. So I'm, I'm reading all this. Some of the students said, Miss per- Ms. Parsons is the most honest person that we know, my mom, my family. And the new girl says, President Obama is the most honest man that I know. He makes a promise, and he made many promises, and he kept them all. He is the most honest man I know. That's great. I looked at that say. and said, keep your lips pursed. Don't say a word. Do not say a word. It's probably one of the hardest restraints I've had to do in my life. But I restrained myself, and I'm just going to ignore it and pretend she didn't write that. Um, I mean, that's a line I am not willing to cross in my classroom. First of all, she's brand new. 
Mm-hmm. Second of all, I have yet to meet her guardians. They could be pro Obama, and the last thing I need is to lose my job because I hate the president. Wow, it is that's a hard, hard, hard position. So you know, it's it's really hard when he is perpetuating those ideas. I mean, it's like you said. You can't, Mr. President, support borders in other countries and then totally walk on our borders when that's what we're requesting. We want the borders. I have a hard time with the immigration issue anyway, and I'll say it this way. There are many people in the voluntarist and anarchist movement who think that uh, you shouldn't look at immigration as legal or illegal because it's all land, and technically we don't own any of the land. People should be able to come and go as they please. That might not be such a bad idea, except for the structure of our government, the structure of our economy and our society doesn't allow for people just to cross borders openly. You know, if we didn't have in place the systems that we have, such as the economic ones, then, you know, if there was no fear of of a collapse happening, if there was no fear of negative repercussions on the system by allowing all these people in, then, yes, that idea would work. But with the current system we have in place, letting people cross borders openly is going to be detrimental to our economic system. Yeah, I mean, it's just the recovery is just going so slow because there's just so much government involvement. And he, you know, he doesn't, he really does not understand economics very well because he's just going to run this country down and it's it's really scary seeing what you know the crazy things that he's you know now he's planning to try and first of all he's been sort of you know not you know and again i know we're like bouncing all over the place and you know here we go for some president bashing but you know here he is saying million times times over oh i'm going to pull the the troops out of iraq but how many times has he sent troops over how many times has he promised to bring them back now he's talking about you know recruiting other soldiers to try and go and go after isis yeah you know but like the like isis and like al qaeda i have no doubt in my mind that isis is a government created entity over in the Middle East. Al-Qaeda is our own government. We're funding these people. So while we're so-called fighting them, we're funding them just to keep the insanity flowing. And I have no doubt that we're slipping money under the table to ISIS as well. I agree. And that's why you should stop using government's currency and you should go into alt currencies such as Bitcoin. I know a lot of people still kind of poo-poo it as imaginary internet money and when I first heard about it I was thinking oh there's just no way that this can go back but you know when you think about the different options that are coming up with Bitcoin and you know also PayPal is now starting to integrate uh, Bitcoin into its service as is 1-800-Flowers let's see what's another one Um, Overstock.com Overstock.com that um, started taking it I believe last year Uh, I, Newegg, that was it. I was like, I cannot think of it. Um, Newegg started taking Bitcoin. Now, what's neat about Bitcoin is that this is, re, you know, for all of you that own businesses or whatnot, I'm sure everyone's frustrated with the debit and credit card fees because how many restaurants do you walk into that say our debit or credit card machines require a five or a ten dollar minimum or whatnot because of processing fees? Well, processing things for Bitcoins are like about. I want to anywhere between three and six cents per transaction. Like it's super low. It's instantaneous. So you know the money is available. There's no record of like there's no way that it can bounce because simply put, it doesn't have the money. It just doesn't go through. It's not like a check where you have to wait for it to clear. You have to wait for you know any sort of clearance to go through. Um, if they look, you know if they lose their money, they don't have to check back and go to the bank. Like the ledger's right there. It's open source. Like where the money comes back and forth. And the neat thing about Bitcoin is that there is this awesome website called Gift with a Y, uh, Gift.com. Gift.com has tons and tons of gift cards you can exchange, uh, such as Old Navy, Amazon, Starbucks, Target. And what's neat about uh, Target, too, is that let's say you buy a Target gift card, but say you want a gift card for, for Buffalo Wild Wings or something like that, you can take your $10 gift card to Target and exchange it for Buffalo Wild Wings if that Target sells it. So essentially, you can buy you know, $10 worth of Bitcoin at Get.com for Target, take the Target gift card and exchange it for any gift cards that they have there. 
that's amazing because I know there are people who are like, oh, my God, this is a gift card to so-and-so. What am I going to do with this? Yeah, and I mean, you know, you know, I shop at Target, too, and while you can get just about everything you need at Target, you can't get everything. But the way that you can change this about is that gift, unfortunately, does not have gas gift cards, which is something that I would love to have because I drive around a lot. I would, I would love to have it. For some weird reason, there's some sort of restriction that they can't have uh, gas gift cards, but I'm pretty sure some Target places carry gas gift cards. I couldn't tell you off the back of my head because I don't really buy gift cards at Target, but let's say you have a $25 gift card for Target and you want to exchange it for gas and they have a gas card, take it to Target, exchange it for that gas card. Boom. You just paid for gas with Bitcoin. And here's another reason that is a wise one to maybe invest in alternative currencies. Um, A lot of people think that the president bringing all these illegals into America, and I'm using illegals for lack of a better term. I know a lot of people get upset Mm -hmm. about that because they say the people are not illegal. So um, they're not illegal people. They are just in a country that's undocumented. So they've gone to calling them undocumented citizens. And a lot of people believe that the president is trying to pull off the Cloward Piven strategy. Now, it's a political strategy outlined in 1966 by American sociologist and political activist Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven that is called for overloading the U.S public welfare system in order to precipitate a crisis that would lead to a replacement of the welfare system with a national system of a guaranteed annual income and thus an end to poverty. And a lot of people believe he's trying to do this to intentionally crash the system so that uh, Marxism and communism or socialism can take its take center stage and he can implement his plan because he's got a bigger plan that that not anybody really knows at this point. He's doing something and cuz he just there was another article that said if the Senate and House of Representatives do not change the immigration policy, he's going to strong arm them and just override them completely, which the president does not have the power to do. <laughs> That, um, you know, the whole thing about a country being undocumented, it reminds me of the movie uh, The Terminal with Tom Hanks, where he's a man from uh, some uh, Cold War country. I want to say Bosnia, but I can't, I don't think it is that. So, you know, please, people that have watched it or are in Bosnia, please don't attack me. I'm just going off of just brief memory. But I believe there's been like some sort of civil um, unrest going on. And now for a brief time, there is no country there because they're rebelling. And so he has to stay in the terminal until his country gets their stuff together and he's just staying there because he has nowhere else to go and it's so tragic and i realize that i'm trying to like put a you know a real kind of humor stamper on your story and i apologize but when you first brought that up it's the first thing that came into my mind (laughs) oh no you're not putting a damper on it it's fine um it's just i have friends who are in the military one of the families that i know they um they live in uh in in an army base and the army base is one of the ones where a lot of those undocumented aliens were um, shipped. I asked her, I said, did you know about this? She goes, we know about it. And I was like, do you know, do you see them? She's like, no, they keep them off in a separate place, but what are they trying to do? And I said, I have no idea. So she's living on base with a secure location of these children that were bussed in. Wow. It's it's really really creepy. He has he has no good reason that we know of for this, but you know it's part of a larger agenda. Yeah, absolutely. It just uh yeah, you know somehow it brings to mind of just you know keeping everybody in a you know closed container and you know having the having the upper hand in it. Yeah, and I want to say too that um, just to remember tomorrow is the. How many years has it been now? Is it 13 uh, years? 13 years. Yeah, 13 years. We were just discussing this today. 13-year anniversary of 9-11. And no matter what you think the cause was, no matter if you think it's a conspiracy theory, no matter if you think that the government was the one who did it, that the government wasn't the one who did it, I, I do want to remind everybody just to have a moment of remembrance for those who lost their lives tomorrow, regardless of who did it, regardless of who they believe was behind it. Um, I know a lot of 
people out there trying to debunk it. I won't get into how I feel about it. I, I don't think it's an appropriate time. Um, but I will say just remember those, remember the loved ones of those who perished. I do have a friend who perished in Tower 2. And so it's a big thing for me to remember that. And uh, I do send my love out to the Braca family who lost their dad uh, 13 years ago tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I, I I remember the 10 year anniversary sitting in a bar with my mom, you know, talking about what had been going on the last 10 years. At, the, at that time, of course, um, I remember when it happened. I remember, and I guess we should be saving this if we be you know, discussing this tomorrow. But we're here tonight, so you're going to hear it anyway. Um, I remember I was in the car. It was a pretty cold morning. And we were, I was homeschooled, so I was able to, you know, go to this in the early morning, but I had an orthodontist appointment. And I remember sitting in the car, and my mom goes quiet, and she turns on the radio. And, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a kid at this point. I, you know, don't really, I guess I'm, I was a teenager at that point. I was a teenager, not really paying attention. What teenager pays attention to the news? I remember asking my mom something. My mom says, shh, 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 because she wants to hear what's going on. And at that point, that's when I heard about it. And I was just thinking, oh, wow. And, you know, the rest of the day, I kept hearing reports. We turned on TV. We didn't really watch TV a lot, but just when the TV was on and seeing that, it was pretty crazy. And it wasn't until, like, months later I just realized just how serious it was. Because, again, I was a stupid teenager. I was working in a large international insurance company when the news hit and the there's a salesman out of the sales department comes in and he says a plane just hit the World Trade Center. They thought it was just an accident and then, you know, it, it happened again. I I'll never for I'll never forget that day. They let us out early that day because Somewhere along the lines, Atlanta had been um, slated to be hit next. We have the CDC. I wasn't working far from the CDC. Lucky me. But Mm -hmm. they let us go home early, and I went over to my mom's work, and I just sat there. We cried. And I got on the computer, started looking up websites and looking up uh, things that directly related to the World Trade Center, and I hit a link to go to Windows on the World, which was the restaurant that was at the top of the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And it said, you know, this connection disconnected. It's it's just an eerie, eerie feeling because there are some companies who host through other sites, and then there are some companies that do direct hosting or direct linking and broadcasting right from their business. When my mom looked at that, she's like, the reason you can't access that site is because the whole company is gone. They must have been sourcing straight from their business. And it's just an eerie feeling to know that over wires and over towers and electricity and um, waves that you are somewhat connected to a business or entity that no longer exists. It's just an eerie feeling. Wow, I could not even imagine that. That's really scary. It is very scary because one minute this business existed and you could look at their website, the next minute the business does not exist and you're being redirected because the business doesn't exist. I mean, it's it's not a direct, direct, direct connection, but just the thought that you can't access it because it's not there anymore. Can you imagine just knowing the near feeling that it's just it's not there anymore? I feel I feel like you. It's almost the equivalent of going home uh, to your hometown and just finding it completely just gone. Because if you lived in a really small town, let's say like a mining town, and you know the you know, they had to shut the mine down for all concerns, and the entire um, the entire community went down. Uh, it was kind of like that because where I used to live in a small town up in North Maine, and there was uh, in Loring, and there was a Air Force base there, and the Air Force base. Um, was there to provide, you know, you know, to, you know there was a BX, there's a commissary, but a few years after we left, it shut down. I'm not sure what the why it was, but it shut down. And when it shut down, it took about 70, 80% of the economy with it, so there's literally nothing there anymore. 
Yeah, it's inc- it's incredibly scary. It's incredibly uh, sad to think about. So um, I will say this. It is time for another break. And when we come back, we will still have two more segments of all the lovely goodness that is me and that is Danica, more Danica than me. Um, but we will be back after a few messages. Yay! That was not one of them. That was my cell phone. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, hold on. Thank you for tuning in to Freedomizer Radio, where we have a 24-7 chat room where you can come and share what's going on in the world with people of like mind. Anything and everything against the New World Order. Dial 347-324-3704 to catch our live show. Beginning at 9 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time, Monday through Friday till midnight, and 9 to 9 on Saturday and Sunday. Take us to the beach. Take us to the park. Take us on a walk with the dog. Only on Freedomizer Radio. Hello, everyone. Proof is here. I want to let you know about our latest promotion on our FreedomizerRadio.com website. Our chat client, Bark, B-A-R-C dot com, is hosting a micro-Bitcoin giveaway while supplies last. All you have to do is go to FreedomizerRadio.com, join our chat room, create a screen name, and type to your friends. And some micro-Bitcoins will fall from the sky. Not only that, the more people that are typing, there will be some random lotteries as well. So just for typing to your friends, you can earn some micro-Bitcoins. So who knows how long this will last, but join us now, FreedomizerRadio.com. There are a lot of problems with Common Core. I don't even have time to go into most of them. But a step in the right direction would be to give local communities, teachers, parents, control over their schools so they can design curriculums and standards to best meet the needs of their students and get the federal government out of education. Good evening. Ancient of Days returns to freedomizerradio.com. Sunday evenings at 7.30 p.m. Pacific, 10.30 p.m. Eastern for 90 minutes of adventures in history, ancient and modern, plus current events here on FreedomizerRadio.com. See you there, Sundays, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Thank you. Hi, this is Cindy Lake. Please listen to me on Freedom Talk with Cindy Lake at 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on FreedomizerRadio.com. All the issues that are important to you, like Common Core, Agenda 21, Free Informed Jury Association, 10th Amendment, 2nd Amendment, 4th Amendment, 3rd Amendment, the Constitution. See you at FreedomizerRadio.com, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you there. Are you dedicated to ending the new world order? Well, it's time to make way for spontaneous order. Hi, I'm Eric Bell, host of Freedomizer Radio's new hit show, For Whom the Bell Tolls, where you will hear current events from a volunteer's perspective, philosophical libertarianism, and a roadmap to a free and stateless society. Tune in every Tuesday at 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific and 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. Okay, and we're back. And we have been all over the map tonight with a lot of fascinating different articles and things to say. Uh, Just on a side note, um, I think it's a congratulations to Ashley Tisdale, famous for High School Musical, and the sweet life of Zach and Cody from the Disney Channel, who got married this week. Wait, Ashley Tisdale got married this week? Ashley Tisdale got married this week. Oh, I guess I'm just going to have to break the news to Mr. Hagen. He will be uh, very heartbroken. Our friend Brian Hagen is in love with Ashley Tisdale. He has made it and stated it clearly. He's not in love with her intelligence because she has none. (laughs) He is in love with her body and just there's something about her that does it for him. So... Um, Brian Hagen is going to be wearing black this week and singing the funeral march and listening to it over and over in his vehicle or anywhere else he listens to music. So sorry, Brian Hagen. But Ashley Tisdale is now a married woman. And 
good luck to the man who married her. Um, I, I hope that this really happens for you. What I can't believe is that she's 29 years old. What? Ashley Tisdale's 29? Ashley Tisdale is 29 years old. Well, actually, well, she was like 22 or something like that when she started in high school musical. Like, I know they were all obviously like way above high school age, but... Yeah, wasn't she 22 like last year? So she jumped up seven years in one year. Well, High School Musical was actually some time ago, sweetie, so... I know. I just like to give it a hard time because... I can't believe she's 29. I mean, even though she was in High School Musical at the age of 22, it still doesn't seem like she should be 29. No, no, it doesn't. And it's just, you know, you have those celebrities that just never seem to age. And, you know, she she's, of course, one of them right now because when you're in your 20s, you seem immortal. But, you know, maybe she'll end up being like one of those actresses like Meryl Streep that, you know, still looks like she did when she was, you know, when she was a young girl, or Michelle Pfeiffer, so we'll see how that goes, but congratulations, Ashley, if you're hearing this. Oh, my God, like, Vanessa Hudgens was one of her bridesmaids. Oh, no, the bridezilla horror. I just have to say this. I just looked up a picture of her husband. He's an odd-looking guy. He, oh, 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 I must look at this. (laughs) You must. You go, go to Google and do a search for Christopher French. And, of course, the first thing that pops up when I type in Ashley is the Tisdale thing. So, uh, let's see. Yep, she is now. Whoa, what is going on with Mr. French? Um, His eyes are a little odd. He's got, like, wicked, crazy arches eyebrows. Oh, maybe that is what it is. Because with those eyebrows, it makes it look like his eyes are too far apart. I know. I mean, he's just, kind of, he's just constantly looking like... Oh, hey, what's up? And it's just like, uh, yeah, his eyebrows are like wicked crazy. And I know I'm saying wicked because I'm in the Boston area, so shut up. It's going to be part of my lingo now. Oh, that's yes, funny. He, he is a very, very odd-looking guy. Um, You know, she's not, sorry, Brian, but she, to me, she's not a looker. Now, she always had kind of a really goofy-looking face, and, you know, I know she had um, plastic surgery to fix her nose, because I guess she had a, a nose problem. Sometimes. She had a, a collapsed, whatever it is. What do they call yeah, that? collapsed, uh, whatever it is. I thought she was <laughs> great without it, but I guess she was having problems, you know, problem being able to use her nose, which is totally understandable, but it's like when she got it done, I'm like, oh. And she had a deviated septum. Thank you, thank you. That's what it was. Yeah, not a collapse, whatever it is, which still would have worked. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm looking at these pictures and just look at those arched eyebrows. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not Joan Rivers, rest in peace. But he's just, he's, you know, like you said, he's very um, interesting looking. I am going to Brian Hagen's page right now, posting this article and saying, "I'm wearing a black ribbon for you." Oh, does he know, does he know about it? Is he like really depressed about it? I don't know if he does. Oh, man. I'm checking out his page. He hasn't posted it. I wonder if he hasn't posted it because he's depressed or if he just doesn't know. I mean, I'm sure he knows. He follows her. Oh, probably. Yeah. I just, I had no, I mean, granted, I don't really, I try not to follow um, Flores that much, but you'd think that she there was something, and I had no idea, but, you know, congratulations, Ashley. You are now trapped in the government bond of marriage. Now, I want to get married someday, so I can't say that, but, yeah, I know a lot of people view it that way, but I I just I want to be married someday. I like the idea of marriage, but, you know, it comes back to, you know, just like we were talking about the Pledge of Allegiance, it's just that your sign, you know, the reason that they had marriage licenses is to prevent, you know, non-whites from marrying white people. And so, and taxes, and taxes. But when you when it comes down to it, the te- you know the official married you know is only going to provide you benefits if you have kids. Now I know you want kids. I certainly don't want kids. So there's no real incentive for me to you know get married. And, you know, and I'm not saying that relationships can't last or you know in marriage or without marriage. I've known plenty of marriages that have gone a long time. I've known marriages that have shambled within two, three years, and I've known relationships that have gone for several years and don't need to have anything of marriage. I mean, it just, I like the idea of marriage, but I mean, it's just, I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes I see all these pictures, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. 
But then I see all the crazy expenses that people go through, and I'm like, nope, 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 not happening. Well, speaking of marriage, I don't know if you know this, but through DNA testing, England has discovered the identity of Jack the Ripper. What? Yes. Now, you're probably wondering, how in the world did she lead that in from marriage to Jack the Ripper? Well, you know, probably because the married couples get so mad at each other that, you know, they literally want to kill each other eventually, I'm sure. So that was the lead in. That's just a sick joke on my part. But, yes, um, the Daily Mail... .co.uk is reporting world exclusive that Jack the Ripper is un, now unmasked and the an amateur sleuth used DNA breakthrough to identify the most notorious criminal 126 years after a string of terrible murders. Wow, technology is indeed amazing. So apparently there was DNA evidence on a shawl found at a Ripper murder scene. Um, it nailed him. Um, they tested descendants of the victim and suspect. Identifications were made. Jack the Ripper has been identified as Polish-born Aaron Kosminski. Kosminski was a suspect when the Ripper murders took place in 1888, and he was a hairdresser who lived in Whitechapel and was later put into an insane asylum. So he was a suspect back in the day, um, it says, it is the greatest murder mystery of all time, a puzzle that has perplexed criminologists for more than a century and spawned books, films, and a myriad of theories ranging from the plausible to the utterly bizarre. Thanks to modern forensic science, the mail on Sunday can exclusively reveal the true identity of Jack the Ripper, the serial killer responsible for at least five grisly murders in Whitechapel in East London during the autumn of 18. 18- 88. We're not talking here 1988. We're not even talking about in the last century, in this century. We're talking about two centuries ago. Two centuries ago. And because they had the DNA, they were able to pin him with this crime because they were able to test the DNA in this day and time. So, so if they know where he came from, Ben, are they going to be able to try his ancestors then? I doubt that they would do that. It says DNA evidence has now shown beyond reasonable doubt which one of six key suspects commonly cited in connection with the Ripper's reign of terror was the actual killer, and they're revealing his identity. It says a shawl found by the body of Catherine Edowis, one of Ripper's victims, has been analyzed and found to contain DNA from her blood as well as DNA from the killer. Uh, the landmark discovery was made after businessman Russell Edwards bought the shawl at auction and enlisted the help of Dr. Jari Lu Helanen, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, a world-renowned expert in analyzing genetic evidence from historical crime scenes. Using cutting-edge techniques, Dr. Lu, Lu Helanen, I guess, was able to extract 126-year-old DNA from the material and compare it to DNA from descendants of a Taoist and the suspect with both proving a perfect match. Wow. I mean, that, that's incredible. It reminds me of some time uh, last year that they um, found the uh, they found the DNA, they found the semi remains of King Richard III and tested that it was in fact him buried under a garage. That it's just amazing. It's just phenomenal that you know, all these years later, hundred and twenty six years old a year old mystery is solved because they found DNA on a shawl. And you know, it it kind of it makes you wonder what this what was wrong with this man? And you asked that they were going to try his family. They can't do that. But also at the same time, that's like saying, you know, there are um, descendants of Hitler still walking around in the world. Yet, even though he perished, whether he killed himself or somebody killed him, um, you can't try them for his crimes. Sure, yeah, and that was just that was me just kind of trolling a little bit, being like, oh, I mean, of course, I mean, if no one in their right mind is going to do that unless you live in like somewhere where there's communism or something because communism. But uh, <laughs> it's actually funny that you bring up the whole, you know, they can't try Hitler's children because I watched this documentary on Netflix uh, about, it, it's called Hitler's Children, and, you know, they talk about um, descendants from the line of, you know, not only Hitler himself, but three other top-name generals. And I, I couldn't tell you the names right now. I'd have to go take a look at it. But 
they were talking about how um, one woman in particular, she when she married, um, she was she you know obviously changed her name, but when she was divorced, she kept her married name because she didn't want to go back to her old name because she was you know she would get ridiculed for it. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's understandable. I mean, I know there were descendants of Hitler who lived in the United States, and they went by the name Hitler at first, and they eventually ended up changing their name as well for safety reasons. I don't blame them. You know, I, you know, I wonder, it seems as though that we have a fairly good relationship with Germany despite everything that happened. And, you know, I'm obviously not over in the European side to find out, but I wonder if the other countries around them still, you know, are... I guess hospitable, nice to them, and have kind of buried the whole World War II and World War One history behind them. Well, you know, it's hard for me because I have a lot of German ancestry, and I would hate to think that anybody would connect me to the horrible atrocities of the Nazi Party. You know, so I hope that all is forgiven and, and they can put it behind them. It wasn't many of the people who are living in Germany now, it wasn't their fault that that happened. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to go around convicting people who had nothing to do with it. That's like when people are saying, you know, people owe us for the crimes that were committed against our ancestors because our ancestors were slaves. Yeah, that's a a very good analogy. And to think somehow I wish the Middle East would also apply that because they've been fighting for centuries over what and you know all the originals you know all the originals that started this war are dead and yet they still keep on fighting and who knows how long they'll keep on fighting yeah and i i strongly disagree with the uos because our family was slaves i don't owe you anything i didn't i didn't hold you as a slave you know and I talked about how my family came over from Germany. Um, My family came over from Germany in the late 1800s on a boat. That means my family wasn't even here to own slaves. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But this mentality of you owe us, you owe us, that's that's the whole generation. That's the mentality of this whole generation. (laughs) I owe you crap. It's true. The kids are like, at school, they're like, Hey, if if I do this, will you let me have my iPod back? If I take up an iPod, you know, can I have my iPod back if I do this? And I tell them I don't negotiate with students. You made the mistake of bringing it to school and playing with it when you weren't supposed to. If it's in their book bag and turned off, I don't care. That's that's none of my business. I'm not going to go through their book bag. They're not doing anything wrong. They can have it in their purse, book bag, whatever. But you don't. I don't negotiate with you. You know, Miss Parsons. I did this. What are you going to give me? Nothing. You should do that. That's an expectation. You should behave. That's an expectation. You're not getting anything for it. If you continue it and keep it going and you keep it consistent on a on a daily basis, sure, maybe we could talk about rewards. But doing what you're supposed to, that's not going to get you anything from me because you're doing what I asked you and what you're supposed to do. So kids aren't allowed to have their iPods at school? Um, They can have them during times, not during instructional times. Gotcha. Okay. You remember remember this, of course. You were the Tamagotchis and Giga Pets that we had in school, right? Yeah. I remember (laughs) I had a few. Did yours go go beep, 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 beep in the middle of class? Um, No, not in the middle of class. I just, I just, I don't know what I did with them. I know I had a monkey, and I had another pet, too. I mean, it was a dog, but um, I just I, I think about these trends and these things that we do at school, and I'm just like, wow. That, uh, that, that's so funny how you're telling them to put their iPod away. And I remember I had a koala that my cousin gave me, and I left it somewhere, and I never told her what happened. I don't remember if she even remembered that. Wow. Yeah, I think my friends and I traded. Um, I traded something to them for the monkey. So I, I don't remember what it was. But, yeah, I owned them and just think that ushered in a whole generation of iPods and tablets and phones. It's just amazing to see how technology has trended. Do you have any kids that carry on tablets or anything like that at school? Like how many kids would you say in your school like carry around? some? When I say cell phone, I mean like 
you know, like a smartphone, like an like an iPhone or Android or something? Oh, well, I'll tell you, because the school knows that these kids have them, they're starting to implement technology policies across the school district. And what I mean by that is basically the attitude is we know you have them, so why don't you put them to good use? If you have a legit reason to look up something on Google, for instance, just as long as you are on the school's network with your electronic device, um, the kids, and there, there's, before they do this, there's an extensive contract that the parents have to sign, that the kids have to sign, and the school has to sign. It is a contract of um, privacy. It's a contract of safety. But the kids are allowed to log in on their electronic devices to use them for educational purposes. Oh, okay. So they're incorporating them. I mean, eventually it is stupid. It is stupid to keep fighting this. You know the kids have them. And when I was a sub in Cobb County, I was just like, yeah, I know you have them. Let's get real. So if you guys work better by listening to music and you're not bothering anybody, you're not text messaging or I don't hear it, I don't care what you do with your phone. I'm not taking them up. And since I know you have them, we might as well not be secretive about it. And, you know, they liked me better for that. And when people say, you know, you're a teacher, you're not there to be liked, it sure makes the job a whole lot easier when the kids appreciate being around you. Yeah, I always wondered how that was like because I, you know, I hate using the term back in my day, but I mean, when I was 16 years old, um, I'm trying to remember. I mean, I we had been using cell phones like earlier, but they were, you know, obviously they're really big, the really big um, kinds of phones that just that were like, like a brick essentially, and you know, they were just used for emergencies, and then obviously the phones got smaller and smaller, and they're the like the basic phones that. I don't think even had text messaging. Like you could play like Snake on them or something oh the like Nokia's that. the Nokia Nokia yeah the ones that that, that <laughs> don't break at all even when you try and chuck it it just it lives. Uh, my mom had a Nokia. I actually had a flip phone and I, it was just like the biggest thing. But you know obviously like I could only take calls. I couldn't do text messaging with it. But you know now you, you know it's just like I see these kids in school with these you know iPhones and stuff. I'm like what are you doing? Stop that! But you know, kids are also now like getting on the Facebook and you know, Imager and Reddit and all these things, and it's just like, ah, you know, I just have to think. You know, I guess that's their version of the internet because when I was in high school, you know, the broadband was just becoming to become a thing, so we had access to broadband internet. Uh, I told my students, they're like, oh, you have a Facebook, Miss Parsons, and I was like, I do. Ms. Parsons, can we add you? No, you may not. And if I find out you have an account, I'm going to report it because you are under the age of 13. You will not be my friend on Facebook, and I will make sure it gets shut down. People, you know, they, they're like, God, that, that sounds harsh. You're not supposed to have an account at the age of 11 anyway. And yeah. you sure as heck are not going to go come and join my page. Oh, no, that's inappropriate. Heck no. I mean, it, it's not... It's even inappropriate if it's a high school student with a teacher. Inappropriate. In no way is my fifth grade class going to add me as a friend. And then one of my students came in and said, "Miss Parsons, I found your page, and um, it's I found it through my grandma's page. And I was like, uh-huh, yeah, and guess what? If I find out what your page address is, it is, it is gone. I'm going to report you. I'm trying to let them know it's serious, and I'm going to treat it seriously. You know, I'm not going to be their friend on Facebook. And he didn't say another word about it. And he goes, can I be friends with you through Grandma's page? I was like, heck no, you can't. I'm not going to be your friend on Facebook. And if I find your page, if I find your Instagram, if I find all of these, they will be shut down. I'll report you. Wow. Yeah, and good for you for doing that because uh, because kids should not be having a Facebook. I, you know, my previous job, I had a boss that just absolutely refused to be friends with anyone from Instagram unless they had left the company. Like, he would not be friends with you if you were still working there. I believe he was friends with some of the senior management, because he was a senior management too, but he wouldn't be friends with anyone, you know, below his um, below his pay grade, essentially. And I, there's also another guy that works there that is friends um, with several of his teammates, and no one's really said anything. I mean, and, and then there goes that whole talking about work and, you know, that kind of thing. And I just, you know, I would certainly hope that people that do report to him, now it's a little different because he's gotten a different position where he doesn't have a team where he's kind of working by himself. 
but you know, I just also wondered like how often was he seeing on people's Facebook pages and being like, oh, that person was not working. I'm going to see their Facebook and see where they were at today in the hopes that that person was completely what they should not be doing. Yeah, precisely. And I have Facebook friends with uh, the people I work with in the fifth grade. I'm friends with two out of the few teachers I found on Facebook. Um, they're they're cool, you know, and I don't post anything on Facebook that's going to get me into any trouble. So whatever, I'm just not going to accept my friends as um, my students as friends. Forget that. No, 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 no. There's. It doesn't matter if I pro- post inappropriate stuff or not. The kids don't need to be my friend on Facebook, and that's all there is to it. Yeah, there's just there's no need to do that. Um, you know, I wanted to add, now that you brought that up, did you sub any, like, high school students that were above the age of 13 in, in previous um, uh, substitutions? And so have they uh, asked to be friends with you? Yes. I have a lot of high school students, and I will explain this. As a substitute teacher, I they, they were not my students. Mm-hmm. They, they were not directly my students. So I did accept them, but also to understand that there were some very um, close students to me in an orchestra class in one of the high schools where I used to sub, that they were in the first class where I ever subbed ever. And I watched them grow up from eighth grade till they graduated from high school, and I am still friends with them today. So it's it's under very special circumstances, and now that I don't sub these kids anymore, I certainly am willing to accept them as well. Because what, at the end of the day, while I was still a sub and an adult, we could all BS around and joke around because they're really cool, mature kids. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, I do have a lot of them, but if they're my direct students, oh, no, no, absolutely not, no. Yeah, I just figured that since you had already been used to subbing, that maybe you had friended people in the past uh, that were no longer in your school district. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And some of them, you know, I mentor and and I love them to pieces. So uh, I do want to say we have about two and a half minutes left in the show. Uh, Next up is the Proof Negative show. You guys should stay tuned. It is on from 9 to 12 Eastern. That is 6 to 9 Pacific. I hope you guys will stick around. Proof Proof does a good job. And he broadcasts four nights a week, Monday through Thursday, um, all nights 6 to 9 Pacific and 9 to 12 Eastern. He actually uh, just, I just quit his show last week just because of time purposes. It ended at midnight here in Georgia and I'm up at 4 in the morning so I couldn't do that anymore. Um, But I did want to say uh, thank you Proof for the time on the show. I'm still a part of the Freedomizer family and it feels good to still remain as a vital part of such a growing and wonderful group. So glad to still be here but I do miss do miss doing that. I just can't do it anymore. Um, but uh, please stay tuned and listen to him. And I'm gonna I'm gonna start wrapping this up here. Danica, thank you so much for all the time that you've been filling in with me lately. I'm having a blast, and I know that uh, it's probably gonna be even a few more weeks to come that I'm gonna have you on here. I love your viewpoints. I love having you, and it is so fun bouncing ideas and articles off of you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. I you know, I also am interested in trying to get into you. I enjoy going all over the board with whatever story that we come up with. It's really um it's a really awesome stress reliever for sure. Well, again, I'm glad I'm glad to have you and we will have you back next week, I'm sure. I'm gonna end the show here with a song called Bells and this is by our friend Harrison Ray. I hope you guys enjoy. Please stick around for Proof Negative. Please check out the show tomorrow night on the Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube from 4 to 6 Eastern. And you guys have a great night and a great week, and we'll see you next time.